So I want to talk about um, Robert Owen. That's where we left off. And uh, the uh, Cotton Mill Factory Act of 1819. And uh, what I want to emphasize here is how now the stories of Robert Peel and uh, Robert Owen uh, coincide here. And, and this is where we see the real influence of Owen and his utopian socialism was not just something that was out there, you know, on the fringes. Um, he's able to propagandize his form of social utopianism to the point where um, a, an act uh, of the parliament um, is derived directly from, from uh, Owen himself. So that, that's pretty impressive. Now, of course, Owen is a big industrial bourgeoisie capitalist. So, okay, so, uh, but this shows, this show also shows the confluence, uh, you know, how these things come together of uh, bourgeois capital and political power. We really see the merging of those two in this moment. And even to the extent that socialistic ideas are coming from the bourgeois capitalist and making those ideas are making their way even imperfectly okay up into the highest echelons of power, of political power. Uh, and uh, Let's see how that works out. Okay, so he created this report in 1817, and then um, he actually prepares a bill for Parliament and submits it to uh, Sir Robert Peel, the one of the ten billionaire or one of the ten millionaires. Uh, in the country at this time, who's a member of parliament and is also newly minted as uh, nobility. Okay. Um, now, as Owen writes the bill, and so, you know, as, as uh, in parliament, you know, you start out with a bill and then you, it's a proposal and then everybody negotiates and, and modifies it until hopefully it gets passed as an act. Uh, but by the time it gets passed, it's very different from the way it started out. Uh, and sometimes it never gets passed, okay? Just there can't be a compromise. Uh, but the uncompromised version that Owen uh, would like to see uh, applies to all children in textile mills. Uh, children under 10 not to be employed. So let's stop child labor uh, at least to the age of 10. Uh, which you know seems reasonable uh, to us, right? Uh, but this is this is uh, you know very strange idea that Owen is proposing here. Children between ten and eighteen uh, not to work more than ten hours per day. So they only have to work ten hours, which really works out to be like um, uh, up to twelve hours with, if you add in meal breaks and an additional half hour for schooling. So it's really a 12 and a half hour day, but some of that's eating meals and schooling, okay? A half an hour of schooling a day. Okay, uh, magistrates to be empowered to appoint professional independent inspectors. Okay, so independent inspectors is of course important because if you don't have inspectors, uh, you're just gonna take the mill own owner's word for it. And inspectors have access to the mill at any time of day. Okay. Um, it all seems very reasonable, um, but uh, met with stiff opposition. But uh, Robert Peel is a pretty powerful person and, and he is sponsoring this bill. Um, so the act is, is actually passed. 
So notice that this is uh, 1815, and it doesn't get passed, you know, for three or four years. Um, so Sir Robert Peel, you know, slow peddling this, and Owen actually uh, faulted uh, Peel for for being not aggressive enough and not, uh, you know, working it enough to get through some more aggressive and more substantial reforms. But these are the reforms that were put in place. It applies to children in cotton mills specifically. Um, that would be calico printing. That would be cotton mills, which is creating yarn. Uh, that would be in uh, weaving operations. And of course, we have the, the Cartwright power loom and you know we're starting to get factory scale weaving taking place as well um, so the act as it finally passes only applies to children in cotton mills which is where they produce the yarn and children under nine not to be employed okay so that's pretty good um, uh, better than having five or six year old kids working in a factory um, Children between nine and 16 not to work more than 12 hours per day, not including the mill breaks uh, or schooling. Uh, and then they set up these shifts uh, so that um, they're not working until the late hours. The shifts between 5 a.m. And, and 9 p.m., uh, at least a half hour breakfast break, at least an hour break for dinner between 11 a.m. and 4 p.m. So it's really like at somewhat near lunchtime. And notice how similar, uh, you know, for the, us who, who have to work and have gone to a job and, uh, and you know, there's all these uh, scheduled lunch breaks and you can only work so many hours per day and how many, so many hours per week. All of these regulations that we have in place right now in the United States go back to this whole experience. Um, and uh, go back to the influence of Owen, because uh, this is how Owen's, Owen's ideas begin to make their way into law. Um, uh, half measures at first, uh, but then over decades and decades have evolved into what we are familiar with. And of course, in, in England today, the regulations are more stringent than they are in the United States, but um, but are being loosened just like they are in the, in the United States, uh, especially through uh, like big tech, you know, Uber drivers don't get these kind of regulations. Um, okay, so shifts only between 5 a.m. and 9 p.m., get breakfast, get a lunch break, you know, in the way that we think of a lunch break if we're punching the clock. Um, but no routine inspections. Um, but if there's two witnesses that go to a magistrate, then the magistrate can intervene uh, upon the witness of two people. And if the mill is in non-compliance, then the magistrate can um, arbitrary, er, arbitrarily order follow-up inspections. Okay. Now, and this is interesting just to think about political debates today in the United States, when you hear politicians and um, conservatives of all sorts, you know, your drunk uncle or who, whomever say these things, you know, it's, these, are not, these are not new things. These are, it's the same thing. They say it all the time. They just say it. Uh, and they said it about child labor. Um, and so the same argument applies. If it applies to, uh, you know, uh, uh, union rights uh, for adult women in the United States in 2021, uh, it applies to children in cotton mills in 1819. Um, <clears throat> there's no need for such a legislation. Uh, the child labor conditions are not that bad. Uh, it interferes with free labor. You want people to be able to choose where and when they want to work, they get to choose. So 
uh, if the parents want to send their kid to the factory, that's their right as a parent. You can't tell parents what to do. And we're hearing this a lot nowadays, this uh, critical race theory trope, um, parental authority. Uh, uh, and, and it not only interferes with the kid's right to work, so the eight-year-old girl, she has a right to work. You don't want to, you don't want to make it so she can't work because you know she wants to go to the factory, and and her parents want her to go to the factory. And if we don't send her six-year-old brother in there, that's going to ruin the whole thing for the adult employees because we need that kid to to shimmy under there while the machine is running and clean it. And the adults can't work if the kid isn't there to clean it. So that's very logical, right? Um, this will make British industry uncompetitive. We need low wage child labor in order to help the economy. You know, and, and, and we just change the terms. It's the same argument. Uh, It's a dangerous, it should be dangerous president uh, for other industries. If it, first it's the cotton mills, next it's the calico printers, next it's the, it's the coal mines. You want to take children out of the coal mines? How are we going to get into those very uh, narrow passages? You need a six-year-old boy to go down that vein. This is going to ruin everything in the whole country. The whole economy is going to crash if we can't employ children. Come on, think about it. Um, and uh, I should say that, uh, oh, I guess that's a little later, but I'll, I'll bring that up if I remember. Um, again, there's no need for the legislation for another reason because the mill owners understand what's going on. They are high level thinking, virtuous people like Sir Robert Peel, uh, and they are going to make it right. They know, uh, they know that uh, maybe conditions aren't as great as they can be, but they're working on it. So there's no need to, to actually make them do it. Um, Restricting working hours is unfair to power our water powered mills. Okay, so uh, uh, the concept is here is if you have a water wheel that's running your factory, uh, that's quite a large contraption and you just have one drive shaft, but, uh, but uh, factories that are running off of steam engines, you can install multiple steam engines at a relatively low cost in comparison and um, have a lot more machines running. Uh, I'm not sure if that argument really, if you do the numbers, I don't know if that really works out. Um, <clears throat> because the, the underlying premise is that water frame mills would have to run longer hours in order to compete with steam powered factories but they're already running 24 seven. So how are, you know, how, how are you going to, uh, you know, how does it, there's no wiggle room. They're running at capacity. Capacity is capacity. And, and they always could have three shifts instead of two shifts. Okay, so um, they just have to get creative. Uh, the bill will force mill owners to employ adults instead of children, making the children unemployable. It's the children. It's for the children. You don't want them to not be able to work. It's for the children. That six-year-old boy needs to make a living. Um, it will have a bad effect on the morals of the mill workers, you know, 
idle hands. The devil will find work for idle hands to do. Um, okay. So, you know, I, I'm, you know, if you've ever been around, uh, you know, somebody of a conservative anti-labor bent, you will have heard these arguments just instead of talking about children, it's talking about teenagers, you know, 20 year olds or something like that, or um, Amazon workers uh, is, a, is a big one right now, um, <clears throat> et cetera, et cetera. Uber drivers is, is a big one that maybe we're not as conscious of because they're, you know, they're working for themselves, they're independent contractors, but there's, they're punching a clock and they're punching a clock by the second. Um, let's see. All right, so then uh, the revolution in France continues. Okay, so this is that long durée sort of notion of history. There isn't just the French Revolution in 1789 and then, okay, great, the French Revolution, duh, that's it. Uh, no, it's, it's ongoing. And especially when we think about the bourgeois revolution in France, we're seeing the, you know, a later stage of the revolution in this outline here, we're seeing a later stage of bourgeois revolution in England because they did the political stuff a century before. Uh, and then they're working through uh, the bourgeoisie taking over power. And we see with Sir Robert Peel, he, he's, he's getting up there. Um, in France, we're still in that back and forth, going back to uh, imperialism with Napoleon. And now in 1814, Napoleon is actually defeated. Um, he ultimately uh, is defeated at Waterloo by, I can't remember the general's name, but um, by the English army. So England is very much uh, drawn into the French Revolution, especially fighting off Napoleon. And Napoleon is ultimately defeated in 1815 and finally exiled. He was exiled before and then came out of, you know, escaped and then regains the throne for a short while. Uh, but ultimately, he's put into permanent exile, and uh, and then Louis. This should be Louis the Seventeenth. This should be Louis the Seventeenth, right here. Um, so I need to fix that. Uh, Louis the Seventeenth is uh, then restored to the throne. So this is a restoration, like we saw with the restoration in England. And, uh, and then we have Charles who comes to the throne in 1824. And so that brings us up to the revolution in France as of 1824. Okay. So that's all kind of going on in the background of the in bourgeois industrial revolution in England. You know, you have the French Revolution is in the background. And the French Revolution is important not only because the, the military is being drawn into it, it has economic effects, um, but also because the ideas of the French Revolution are gaining traction, not only in France, but in England and all over Europe. Um, so, uh, uh, the slogan of liberty, fraternity, and equality of the French Revolution is inspiring people to think, hey, yeah, we, it can be better and, and the people can govern themselves. Uh, we don't need monarchy. Uh, and, and of course, all the while, the British are just making that happen on the ground. 
uh, and slowly but surely uh, chopping away the power of the monarchy. All right. Um, and, and I should say, going back here, you know, uh, to the Cotton Mills and Factories Act of 1819, um, Sir Robert Peel, you, you know, he is kind of, um, even though Owen is not happy with his aggressiveness in the matter, Peel is to some extent trying to cor correct his sins of the past of child exploitation. Uh, and, and that's part of bourgeois politics is, uh, and, and that's what ultimately evolves into liberalism. Liberalism is a way of making capitalism not so harsh. Don't wanna get rid of it entirely, let's just, let's just fix it and let's, you know, let's not have child labor and let's get a shorty, shorter working day, not only for kids, but for everybody, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and let's have some, some welfare programs and let's have some medical care and things like this. That, those are ways of ameliorating the worst effects of capitalism. And so, uh, and that's really what is meant by liberalism and even conservatives because uh, Robert Peel is a conservative uh, he, he in the way that Paxton de describes. Um, he's something of a royalist, uh, very strong Anglican, um, makes a lot of moral arguments along Anglican uh, theology type terms, um, but is all wrapped up with a kind of nationalism where in fact, although he's you know, claims to be supporting the monarchy, he is actually intimately involved in taking away the power of the monarchy. And, uh, you know, the moralism is not so much about, you know, like really following the Sermon on the Mount of Jesus or anything like that. It's just a kind of um, uh, uh, etiquette and proper way of being. And uh, it's a way of bolstering his uh, rectitude in relationship to like genuine nobility that have been around for a long time. Um, so there's a kind of nationalism wrapped up in it. And then the liberals, are contrasted with those conservatives by being more interested in really helping uh, lower class people, working class people, uh, but definitely not committed to getting rid of capitalism. They still want capitalism because liberals and conservatives both are benefiting uh, from capitalism uh, tremendously. So there's, there's conservative bourgeois capitalists, or there's conservative capitalists, let's say, and there's liberal bourgeois capitalists. And when I say bourgeois, uh, that really is liberal. Like liberal and bourgeois begin to become the same thing. And that's really the, the meaning of bourgeois from a Marxist uh, perspective, especially as it was used in the 20th century, um, is that th this liberal attitude of fixing capitalism by acts like the Cotton Mills and Factory Act of 1819, this is a liberal bourgeois sort of thing, but liberals really haven't emerged yet, um, <clears throat> but they will very shortly here. Uh, not actually not really by the end of this, this outline, but then right after that, okay. Um, <clears throat> So the revolution is going on in France, and then um, now this is this is something that's interesting about Owen. He didn't just talk about the ideas of his utopian socialism. He actually did an experiment, and he tried to make it work. So he bought the town of uh, Harmony in Indiana, uh, which was an actual town that already existed, but it had been abandoned. Uh, if I remember, uh, uh, a religious uh, intentional community had lived there, and then they moved to another location. Um, 
so he buys this town. There's some 180 buildings and several thousand acres of, of land in Indiana. That's good farmland. And um, so he buys that in January of 1825. And then February and March, he's in Washington, D.C., giving speeches and uh, meeting with people and networking. And he addresses the House of Representatives twice. Uh, and in, in attendance are, I believe that even Thomas Jefferson was in attendance here. So this is a pretty high profile um, sort of uh, uh, speeches. And it really helps to propagandize and spread the idea of socialism into the United States. This, it, for many people, uh, was the first experience in the United States that they had of socialism. And Owen seems to have been pretty effective at his, at his rhetoric. And, um, and, and so a lot of people get excited about it. So he recruits a lot of uh, philanthropists, scientists, artists, and educators, some just to uh, finance the, you know, the, the community and others to actually join it, you know, and, and set up the school and, and set up art programs and, and, and all these sorts of things. Uh, William McClure is um, a financial backer, but he's also intimately involved and he and Owens' sons um, are left to manage the community in New Harmony and Owen goes back to England. Now, um, and, and uh, at this time, Owen doesn't return to Scotland, he returns to London uh, primarily. Uh, over the year, you know, or maybe at first, there's up to a thousand people who were in New Harmony, but uh, within, uh, within a year, uh, the community has dwindled quite significantly. And, and in 1827, uh, a couple of years later, the community is dissolved. But uh, Owen's sons and his daughter, they remain in New Harmony, and I'm not sure how long they remain there, but um, but that would be uh, something to look at uh, that I will try to find out. Lots of other communities also pop up at this time, but they dissolve by 1827 as well. So based upon Owen's speeches and networking, he gets a lot of people to experiment with his idea and the experiment doesn't work. Obviously there's something fundamentally wrong with it. Um, <clears throat> So, and it's all based on, on what I discussed in the, the previous video, where you have like 500 to 3,000 people and try to make a self-contained community. Um, uh, but it seems to have not worked well at all. Okay. And, and that seems to be pretty typical for communes, as I, you know, I was saying, like in the sense of the 1960s. In the 1960s, there was a big explosion of communes, and they did well for a year or two, but most of them fell apart after that. Some of them lasted longer, um, but ultimately, they they seem to fall apart at the seams, and. Um, you know, what are the reasons for that? Uh, you know, that's an interesting sort of sociological question. Because <clears throat> it seems feasible. Uh, but this, of course, uh, theoretically is, you know, the big argument that Marx and Engels have against Owen and other utopian socialists is they think they can exist within a larger uh, political structure and not have that larger political structure, uh, you know, undermine what they're trying to do in a microcosm. Okay, let me, uh, well, let me finish this up here. Um, there's the Cotton Mills Regulation Act of 1825, which is uh, just a revision of the 1819 Act because only two prosecutions had occurred under that, which means it wasn't being enforced. And um, 
And so instead of requiring two witnesses for a magistrate to get involved, magistrates are empowered to independently uh, investigate on their own initiative. Um, Owen divests himself around this time after the failure of New Harmony. He divests himself of the new Lenark mill and um, his wealth is largely de depleted because he spent it all on New Harmony. So, you know, he took a big risk and, and tried to see if it works and, 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 and you know, and didn't work. Um, but he is not deterred. He continues to propagandize for these ideas and continues to build organizations and write newspaper articles and, and all this sort of stuff to get people uh, interested in it. And what we see here emerging in Owen is, uh, and some of the people that he was involved with uh, actually evolved into anarchists. So a lot of things that Owen is doing, although he thinks of them as in, in socialist utopian terms, they, it actually is laying the groundwork for anarchism, which uh, survives to this day you know, utopian socialism, like in the 1960s, okay, there was a revival of it, but then it faded away. And as a utopian socialism kind of pops up every once in a while uh, and, and goes through a very similar experience as what Owen experienced. Um, but uh, anarchism is more of a, a constant feature once we reach about the mid 19th century which is when the Communist Manifesto was written. Uh, from that point forward, a, a strong anarchist movement begins to build internationally and is something that's always prevalent like in, within the United States and American society, even to this day. And what's very characteristic of anarchists and, and how it's rooted in the experience of Owen is that um, anarchists very self-consciously say, hey, we're just gonna experiment. This isn't going to last forever, but we're just going to try something and see how long it lasts. And they're perfectly comfortable with that. Um, uh, David Graeber, uh, he died recently, but he, he was this kind of anarchist that was just really happy to, to do experiments in, um, in horizontal, uh, direct democracy where everybody can vote and and uh, and share their ideas and, and all this kind of stuff. And uh, Graeber was one of the big organizers of the Occupy Wall Street um, action in Zuccotti Park. So the main uh, center of Occupy Wall Street back in 2011. And, uh, you know, in, and he in no way, shape or form saw that as any kind of defeat. He saw that as a great success uh, because they experimented and it lasted, uh, you know, and was way more coherent than he ever expected. Uh, so, so, you know, that's the kind of um, anarch a certain type of anarchist attitude that comes out of these uh, utopian socialist experiments. Okay, um, so let's uh, cut off this video here and I'll see you in the next video.